Lord, we magnify you. We glorify you. We praise you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you guys can grab a seat. It is so excited to see a packed house on prayer night. How many of you, this is your, your first prayer night. Just raise your hands, raise your hand. Look around the room. Hey, let's give it up for all those who this is their first prayer night. Here's what we say. If you can only make one service, make it first Wednesday. Amazing things when we gather together as a church to pray. And so I want to say thank you so much for joining us for First Wednesday. For those of you who are in the Connect page watching online right now, thank you for tuning in and joining us. Next month, why don't you come and join us in person? It's always an amazing time in prayer together as a church. So here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to continue our study through the book of Psalms. We're taking this entire year and we're teaching through the book of Psalms. And the, the sermon series is called Praying Through the Psalms. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We're picking different Psalms and then we're going to teach you and we're going to work through how we begin to pray through the scriptures. And the sermon title for tonight is this, How Do I Deal with Disappointment? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been disappointed? Yeah. I know you have. Do you know why? Because you're alive. <laughs> and to be alive is to, in some ways, be disappointed. Yeah. I know that many of us, we experience disappointments. 2020, it's a big disappointment, right? I mean, we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of 14 days to flatten the curve. Anybody feeling a, a little disappointment? In, in those two years, many of us have experienced a lot of disappointment. Disappointment when it comes to our careers, when it comes to our education. For me, one thing was I was in college and I made a 3.8 GPA. I was going to get that sash graduate magna cum laude looking forward to flying out to Arizona and walking across the stage because I flunked out of college two times and I was told by a teacher I was stupid and I wanted to get that sash and moonwalk across the stage and do something with a finger that pastors are not supposed to show other people <laughs> just for her. But um, the COVID canceled my graduation and so now I have student loans without a photo of me moonwalking across the stage. It was a great big disappointment. I know many of us, we deal with disappointments when it comes to our careers. That you prayed and you believed for promotion and you didn't get it. Maybe it's a financial disappointment. Maybe it's a, a marital disappointment. Maybe some of you are single and you thought by now you would be married. And so you're feeling and dealing with disappointment. Or maybe you are married and now you find yourself facing a divorce and there's disappointment. You never thought that you would be here. I know there's many who are dealing with infertility issues, and so you're wrestling and you're dealing with disappointments in that area of your life. Prodigal sons and daughters who have grown up and ran away from the faith, and you're a godly parent, a mother or father, and you're believing for their salvation, and yet it doesn't seem like they're close or even want to listen to the things you say. And what's the response in that? You're dealing with disappointments. How many of you, just a quick raise of hands, you're dealing with disappointment right now. You're, you're in the middle of it. This isn't just a sermon. This is something you're experiencing. This is your life. I want you to know that you're in really good company because if you read through the Bible, every one of the heroes and characters that we admire and we revere, guess what? They had to experience disappointment. Adam and Eve, they experienced disappointment. God comes to them in Genesis 3 and says, through the seed of a woman, will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. But Eve never got to see that. And she had to live with the mistakes that she had made. And she had to deal with that disappointment. In fact, that disappointment led to the murder of her, of her son. And so she had to learn how to deal with that disappointment. You look at godly men like Abraham. How long did he have to wait for a child? So he's 99 years old. There's a lot of disappointment in there. And then even whenever out of sin he had a, a child, then that child was not to be the one that receives the inheritance and it caused a lot of conflict and drama within the family and so he had still to live with that disappointment. God's greatest heroes, could you imagine Moses on the precipice of the promised land, but yet he is not allowed to enter. 
disappointment. Think about Joshua. As we just studied the book, at the end of it, he says, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then Josh, in, in the next book, the book of Judges, Judges chapter two, what happens? The entire nation, one generation removed from Joshua, falls away from God. His legacy seems like it's been lost. It's a disappointment. We look even forward into the New Testament Great people that we admire, people like Elizabeth or Zechariah who held on to a promise that they were going to see the Messiah. They got to see that promise, but how many years between the time they received the promise to the time they saw the fulfillment did they wrestle with this great disappointment? Paul dealt with disappointments. The apostles, they had to experience disappointment. How do you think it felt in Acts chapter 1 whenever they gathered together to select the new disciple because their friend Judas betrayed Jesus. Do you imagine the disappointment that they experienced in that room too? See, listen, you may feel like you're alone in your disappointment, but I want you to know that the greatest men and women of faith that we learn from and we revere and we admire, they all dealt with disappointment too. So you're not alone if you're feeling disappointment. But there's one person in the Bible that I think probably experienced disappointment more than others, and it's, it's King David. David had to deal with disappointment a whole lot. Could you imagine being a little, a little shepherd boy? And, and here's what you do. You, you kill a bear, you kill a lion, you kill Goliath, the giant. And then all of a sudden, a prophet comes to town. And the prophet is looking for a new king. And he goes up to your dad and says, Bring me all of your sons. God told me to come to your house and I'm gonna choose the future king. And what does the dad do? He lines up every single one of the sons except for David. How many of you have never been picked for a team before? You ever feel that? You're like back in second grade, kickball. Everybody lines up in the wall. I'll take you, 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 you. And then you're the awkward kid who never gets picked. Okay, anybody? You don't have to raise your hand for that, but we can amen in our hearts, right? That's David. Could you imagine the disappointment? How long do you think it took David to forgive his dad for leaving him out of that? And then what happens? Samuel, he anoints David, a little boy, to be what? To be the king of Israel. But yet he still has to go back and tend the fields. He still has to go back and he's a shepherd boy. You know, you know he's the promised king, the future king, but yet at the same time, he has no authority for years, decades. And then he goes into Saul's palace and he begins to do what? Serve Saul, a wicked king who tries to kill him. He befriends his, his brother named Jonathan. And what happens? He watches his best friend die in battle. He's serving Saul and then Saul turns and starts throwing spears at him. So he runs away and hides in caves. The future king is now an outcast. Can you you feel the disappointment that he has? Even when he becomes a king, what happens? He's in constant battle with the Philistines. And the Philistines, they rage and they wage war and they win many battles. And David suffers and still defeats. And at the end of his life, even though he was a man after God's own heart, He had too much blood on his hands to build the temple. And so he had to learn how to to deal with disappointment. If you're here today and you're dealing with disappointment, I want you to know you can take great comfort from the book of Psalms. And one Psalm particularly is Psalm 37. And it's really about how to deal with disappointment. Now, the Bible doesn't use the word disappointment in Psalms 37. Instead, it uses a different word. It's this word fret. It says, fret not. And here's how it says it in Psalm 37, 1. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Look what it says in Psalm 37, 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not for yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices, Psalm 37, 8. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself if it tends only to evil. Now, for us, we don't really use that word fret very often. And so we don't really know what fret actually means. And so here's some dictionary definitions of what fretting is. Fretting is a constant or a visible worried or an anxiousness. 
Fret is also, uh, it's to eat or to gnaw, and it is to corrode. Here's what happens. When we allow disappointment to settle in our hearts, here's what happens. It begins to corrode our faith. When we give in to disappointment, when we give voice to disappointment, when we empower disappointment in our life, it corrodes the things that God has done and what God wants to continue to do in our lives. It corrodes. Another example is the acid fretted the material. Another example is this, it's to rub or it's to chafe. The example is the harness strap was fretting the horse. And here's what, here's what disappointment does. It begins to rub, it begins to give friction, it begins to cause dis-ease, it begins to cause discomfort to your life, and eventually, as it continues to build, it's gonna bring sores and wounds into your heart and to your soul when you give voice and credence to disappointment in your life. When you give disappointment room in your life, it is not only going to affect your life, but what I can tell you is this, it will begin to diminish the effectiveness of your prayers. Because what's gonna happen is this, when you give it to disappointment, you're gonna think, why bother? Why worry? God's not gonna do anything. God hasn't done anything. God's not gonna fix this. God's not concerned and God's not caring about my life because you have given more credence to disappointment than you have to the Lord's promises over yourself. And so when you give in to disappointment, when you let it take root in your heart, then all of a sudden, the things of the Lord don't seem very important to you. It becomes a lot easier for you to miss a Sunday at church. When you're disappointed, it's a lot easier for you to no longer go to small group. When you're living a life in disappointment, it's easy for you to skip first Wednesday prayer night because you don't see it as important and you don't believe that it's actually going to work in your life. When you give voice to disappointment, it is going to cause you to be discouraged and then eventually it's going to rob you of an effective prayer life as well. So what do we do when we're disappointed? I want to kind of give you this. Uh, I say this all the time. It says this, the gap between frustration and expectation is our communication, right? In marriage, when there's disappointment, well, what's the problem? Well, you need to get alone with your husband or your wife, and you need to talk it out, because if you don't talk it out, you'll walk it out, and that's never a good thing. And so it's communication. Your frustration can be really high because your expectations are not being met. And what's the gap between the two of those? It's communication. That's the same true for marriage. That's the same true for any work relationship that you have, maybe with your boss or a coworker. It's true when it comes to raising your kids, but it's also true when it comes to your relationship with God. What do we call prayer? It's communication with God. That's all prayer is. Prayer is a communication with God. And so when your frustrations are high and your expectations are being unmet, what do we do? You're disappointed, so what do we do? We begin to pray to God. We begin to communicate to God. We bring our disappointments to him. And that's what I want to show you that David does. As David is dealing with disappointment, he doesn't give up. He doesn't blame God. He doesn't say, God, why me? God, why is this happening? God, I can't trust you. I don't believe in you. God, you're not good. I doubt your promises. I don't believe in your word. He doesn't give up. He doesn't run away. Instead, he runs to God and he has a conversation through prayer. And so I want to show you just four things that David does to deal with disappointment. And I want to present these things to you as things that we must do whenever we feel disappointed as well. The the first thing David says is this, to trust in the Lord. Here's what he says. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and be friends faithfulness. Look what he says here. He says to trust in the Lord and do good. Now, in the original, there's not a comma there. It just says, trust the Lord, do good. And here's what I want you to know, is that, is that faith in God requires you to act on that faith. When you're dealing with disappointment, it's not enough just for you to sit back and say, I have faith in God. You got to get up and you got to exercise the faith that you already have. This is what they tell people who are dealing with depression. It's not good for you to stay home, sit in the dark and watch TV. You gotta get up off the couch, go outside, get some sunlight. You gotta do something. 
Because the longer you stay in when you're depressed, the greater the depression becomes. I would say the same thing happens when it comes to disappointment in our souls. The longer we sit on the sidelines, the less we act on our faith, the greater the disillusionment and the greater the disappointment is going to continue to become. It's not enough just for you to say you have belief in God. You have to activate that belief. If you're taking notes, write this down. Faith is belief in action. That's why he says, befriend faithfulness. He says, trust God, do good, befriend faithfulness. It's a two-way street, just like friendship is a two-way street. Phones work both ways. You have to get up and do something. If you want your faith to grow, you got to step out and you got to exercise and operate in that faith. It says to trust in the Lord. So what are some things when you're feeling disappointed that you can do to, to trust in the Lord? I think one thing you can do, and you're doing it tonight, is coming to first Wednesday prayer night. You know what you're doing? You're trusting the middle of your week, a busy week, you're trusting your time to God by coming and gathering and praying. That's trusting the Lord, because you're acting on your faith. You believe prayer is important, so you prioritize prayer by being at first Wednesday prayer night. Another example is gathering together as a church. Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembly. Why? Because in doing so, we stir one another up for what? Love and good deeds. What are you doing? You're exercising your faith when you come to church. Another example is by being in a small group. You're saying, I believe that community is important, and it's not enough for me to believe it. I'm actually going to do it as well. One great way for you to trust in God is through tithing. Giving 10% of your finances first and best to the Lord. Because here's what happens. When you put God first in your finances, you learn to begin to trust God when it comes to financial situations. That God is your provider. That God is going to take care of you. That you can do more on 90 than you can do with 100. And you are trusting the Lord in these areas. And as you begin to trust God and begin to do good, you're going to find yourself in a place to where you're depending more on him than looking around and comparing yourselves to others. So the first thing he says is this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust in God. And so when you're disappointed, I want you to say, God, I'm trusting in you. God, I'm gonna trust in you and I'm gonna look around to see who I can bless in the meantime. Yeah. The second thing is this, is to delight yourself in the Lord. Here's how he says it here. He says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That word delight in the Hebrew, it, it means to have joy. It means to have pleasure. And another word that we could use is this. It's, it's to find luxury in the Lord. I was thinking about this this week and um, me and Ashley were getting ready to go on our five-year church anniversary little vacation getaway and we're going on a cruise and we actually went on a cruise about, I don't know what, babe, eight, nine years ago. We went on a cruise for our five-year wedding anniversary and I remember as we went on this cruise, um, we went to the big fancy dining hall and the dinner and one night they, they, were, they were having lobster and I've never had lobster before, so I was pretty excited to eat, eat some lobster like that. And so we sat down and we're eating the lobster and afterward we leave. And then the next night we had another great dinner and then we leave. And then we go on this excursion and we're sitting next to this newlywed couple and we're talking about the food and everything. And he was like, man, did you have the lobster? I was like, yeah, it was really good. He's like, oh man, it was so good. And I said, well, it just wasn't very filling. And he was like, what are you talking about? I was like, I, I wish it would have been like bigger, you know? It's only like a couple ounces. I wish I could have had like more. And he said, what are you talking about? Said, what are you talking about? He's like, I had eight. I said, you had eight lobster tails? How did you do that? And here's what he told me. It's an all-inclusive cruise. <laughs> For two whole days, I am on a calorie deficit <laughs> on a cruise. Right? I could have been living a life of luxury. But that's the same way it comes to our faith in God. Is that you can live a life of luxury in the Lord. But many of us, we're not entering into the luxuries that God has for us. The luxuries of his goodness and his mercy and his, his glory. The luxury of his presence. And when we delight ourselves in God, we are leaning into the luxury. Listen, you can have as much of God as you want. Do you want more of God? It's available for you. God is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. God is like an all-inclusive cruise line where you can live in the luxuries of his goodness and of his grace. You can have as much of God as you want. And so if you're here tonight, you're like, God, I need you. Guess what? God's gonna give himself to you. 
If you're here and say, God, I just want to know you better, here's what God's going to do. God's going to reveal himself to you in greater ways. You can have as much of God as you want. And my concern for many of us is that we leave church still hungry. Because we don't press in and we don't indulge in the things that God has in store for us. So my prayer is that when you're disappointed, you won't come to church with your arms folded, looking at the preacher and judging and criticizing everything he says. That you won't be that person in worship when everybody's lifting their hands. You have your arms crossed and saying, well, I just don't know if I agree with those things. You don't want to be that person. You want to be the person who says, God, if you want it, if you have it, I want it. God, if it's available, I want it for me. God, I am going to indulge in the luxuries that you have provided for me. I'm going to trust in you, and I'm going to delight myself in you. And then here's what he says. He says, when you delight yourself in the Lord, what does he do? He gives you the desires of your heart. Jesus would say it a different way. He would say, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. The more you delight yourself in God, the more God gives you the desires of your heart and the lower your disappointments become because in Christ you already find everything that you truly want and desire and need. The third thing is this, is to commit yourself to the Lord. Here's, here's what he says. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and what is he gonna do? He will act. When you're disappointed, you have to decide before any sort of problem comes the way, right? So you gotta look at the disappointment and you say, no matter what's gonna happen next, I am already gonna decide that I'm gonna trust in the Lord and I am going to delight in God. And so you're gonna commit yourself to those things. Whatever might come, hell or high water, I'm gonna stay faithful to the king. No matter what comes my way, I am going to commit myself to the Lord. Listen, it's because that great things do not happen by accident. Nobody ever tripped and fell into holiness. Right? Nobody ever just accidentally fulfilled their purpose in life. Nobody just randomly discovered what their destiny was. No, what happens is you have to make a commitment to be able to pursue after those things. And that's why it says we must commit ourselves to the Lord. Decide today that when disappointment comes my way, I am not going to let it take me off a track, but I am going to continue to passionately persevere and to pursue after God. If you're taking notes, write this down. Commitment is what transforms promises into realities. See, God has made a lot of promises God's made promises that he will always be there for you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. God's made promises in your life and in your marriage and in your future. God's given promises that, that he, will, he, he will restore us, that he will forgive us, that he will save us. And those things are great, beautiful promises. But if you do not persevere and you run away, then those promises do not meet the reality. But what happens is when we commit the promises of God then become realities in our life. Another way that we can put it in simple terms we can understand is when a husband and wife gets married. On their wedding day, what do they do? They make promises to each other, do they not? For sickness and health, till death do us part. I make this promise to you. But what happens if a husband and wife make promises but they do not honor their commitments? those promises do not become realities. It's the same way for us. For us, when it comes to the covenant that we have with God, that God will love us, he will covenant towards us, he wants to be in relationship with us, but at the same time, there's things that we must do, there's commitments that we must make to be able to daily persevere and to enter in through relationship with him. And so what do we do? We're going to make a commitment to God that I am going to passionately pursue and persevere even when things are hard, even when things are difficult. I am going to remain with you. You must decide what it is what you do because commitment is what transforms promises into realities in your life. The, the, the final thing we see is this, is that we're going to trust in the Lord when we're disappointed. We're going to delight in the Lord. We're going to commit ourselves to the Lord, and we're going to be still before the Lord. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself. As I was reading this week, I came across the story of George Mueller. I don't know if you guys know who George Mueller is, but he was a great missionary 
overseas and he did, he fed thousands and thousands of children and he, that was his ministry. He, he created these, these, um, these feeding houses to where he would take care of orphans and widows. And he never, he never asked anybody for money, but God would always provide exactly what he needed and when he needed it. And God really took care of him. And it was over this verse in Psalm 37, in his, auto, in his biography, he was writing and journaling through this. And, and here's what he says. As he talks about being still and waiting patiently from the Lord, the verse below this, it says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he may fall, he shall not be cast headlong for the Lord upholds his hands. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his children begging for bread. In that note, he writes, the Lord directs the steps. Oftentimes we, we, teach, we teach that, we hear that. That, that God, he directs our paths, that God, he guides us, that God, he leads us, that God, he directs our steps. But George Mueller said this, and I want you to hold it in your mind, especially when you're dealing with disappointment, is that God not only directs your steps, but God also directs your stops. Wow. It's so important when you're disappointed to not make a decision that is going to prevent you from accomplishing what God has in your life. Don't make a permanent decision while you're disappointed because that disappointment may actually just be a temporary setback. The Lord will direct your steps. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will show you the way. But also, it's very important for us as believers and followers of Christ to not only just follow God, but to sometimes just rest in him. To not only say, God, what is my next step? But sometimes just be okay if God tells you, hey, stop for a moment. And rest in me. I know that many of you right now, you, you feel like your life is in a disappointment phase. And in that disappointment, what you're trying to do is you're trying to think your way out of it. But I don't think that's the right thing for us to do. I think instead of trying to think our way out of it, we need to pray God's presence in the middle of it. And as we bring God's presence into our disappointments, here's what God does. God turns our disappointments into a divine appointment to where now we get to spend time with him. What is the gap between frustration and expectation is communication. So what does God want? He wants for you to make an appointment with him. So in your disappointment, he can turn into a divine appointment and he can begin to speak into your life. I love what Corey Ten Boom says. She says this, she says, worry does not rob tomorrow of its sorrow, but it empties today of its strength. Instead of trying to figure everything out and think your way through it, here's what we need to do instead. We need to trust in the Lord. We need to delight ourselves in the Lord, commit ourselves to the Lord, and then find rest in the Lord. And God will turn your disappointments into a divine appointment where you can begin to spend time with him.